Hello Lockdown Guardians fans, it is a new webcam, same Lockdown Guardians. We're going to get into a tough game to watch today, but we'll discuss what went down against the Houston Astros. We're going to continue looking at under the radar prospects, diving into pitchers today. We're going to look at what pitchers stand out, um, not only just the underrated, maybe the ones that could be a little overrated as well, on today's episode of Lockdown Guardians. <laughs> You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Guardians. Sorry for that delay there at the top. The computer was just chug, chug, chugging along. Uh, very slowly. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, I also want to take a moment and say thank you for making Lockdown Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is you get podcasts. And then, additionally, uh, my name is Jeff Ellis. I've been the host of Lockdown Guardians since its inception. Uh, before that, as a lead draft and prospect analyst for Scout in 24 7. That is my first love. At some point, we will get into uh, my shadow draft and we'll you know talk a little bit more about the draft but right now let's focus on today's game so should we do the good or the bad uh it is currently six nothing in the uh ninth hey they had something cooking in the eighth and what is interesting in terms of the game itself is there has been one walk by the guardians and you know i was all about trading for Sean Murphy, and I still think, like, long term, he is, you know, going to be an elite catcher. And, <laughs> you know, I really enjoy Avery um, online. He and I definitely got into it today. So if you're listening, Avery, I still enjoy interactions, <laughs> even when we have a day where, like, I'm just signing off and walking away. Because, listen, there are a lot of people who feel that you shouldn't trade any prospect ever. And, you know, I'll get into this more in segment two, but I feel like there's a lot of disingenuous talk when it comes to how we discuss prospects, especially when it's like the idea of this guy is the greatest prospect since. Again, that's going to be in segment two. But I, you know, I, I just don't know one, you know, what they're going to do with catcher next year. Because catching is really hard and expecting Bo Naylor to step in and catch 120 games next year is foolishness. Rookies don't do that. They just don't. And he's not going to get that role from the start. Two, they have such a high threshold that they want for framing and calling a game. They're not going to trust a rookie with that. Uh, I would not be shocked to see them, you know, have him even roll out somewhere in the outfield at points. He's a good athlete. I, I don't think they're going to trust him as an everyday catcher. And with Austin Hedges hitting free agency, I am deathly afraid of the idea of Tyler. Tyler? Nope. Tyler Molly is a pitcher. Luke Maley is a catcher that the Guardians have. And... Yeah, I mean, the the upside is, I mean, Hedges is going to be one of our players of the game. And, uh, you know, I how should I phrase this? He's been really a lot better of late. You know, um, you know, I saw someone posting that, like, his runs created plus was over a 107 since July 1st. And I don't know how that's possible when his runs created plus in July was a 90 and in August is an 82. So I feel like that was a bad stat that someone had. His second half is a 114. But I don't know exactly, you know, that, that's basically since the All-Star break. So, yeah, since the All-Star break, he's actually been a really strong catcher. And one of the big reasons for that is he's walking a lot more. And right now he's the only guardian in this game to have walked. Right? He's walking 14% of the time. He has cut back on his strikeout percentage to 20%. That's a 4%, almost 5 percentage drop in K rate. Now, this is a very small sample size. And his walk rate is nearly tripled. So I don't know if that walk percentage is going to stick. That I mean, obviously that stands out. If you're like, well, maybe he's been lucky. Well, his bat pips are terrible. Um, first half, I mean, that's the thing. His, and we talked about this on this very show. His bat pip showed that he was unlucky. Like, he is not a bad athlete, Austin Hedges. He can run pretty well for a catcher. The bigger issue for him is just contact, but 200 bat pip is low. It's currently 235. Someone could say in the second half since the All-Star break that he has continued to stay kind of unlucky uh, in these games. But what else has changed? You know, when you go through and you look at it, 
it is interesting. He's at a 114 uh, runs created plus, but his OPS is 695. I, I need to really pay attention to how much runs created plus. If, I don't think it's tied at all to um, uh, to your position, but maybe it is uh, just based on the OPS and the runs created plus. But you know, he's been actually a pretty good catcher, and you know, in our old box score bingo, it's like who has reached base twice in this game. Uh, your list begins and ends with Austin Hedges. That is unfortunately it for them in this one. This has not been a great offensive performance all around uh, on any level. Uh, you had Stephen Kwan got a 16th uh, hit in a row in a game. That streak, I believe, passes Michael Brantley um, for the longest rookie streak for a player in recent memory. Uh, it has been... Well, and it's funny, my video feed over here with my game box score feed over here are not synced, so I already know what's going to happen. They're going to lose, okay? So they have lost this game 6 nothing. Man, just three hits and one walk. It was, you know, a rough performance across the board. The three hits, one to Quan, one to Naylor, one to Hedges. Hedges also had a walk. Plesak, four and a third, four earned runs, five walks. You're just not going to win when that happens. Four strikeouts. Seven hits. It was he was letting base runners on left and right. Nick Sandlin continues to pitch well. I mean, I will take two thirds of an inning with no walks. You know, Brian Shaw had a good outing, one of his better outings of the year, and definitely one of his better outings the past few months. And then Kirk McCarty came in and three innings, two gave up. Really didn't expect to see Martin Maldonado. Remember the they were struggling so badly at catcher. Houston went out and added Christian Vasquez because they needed. You know, Maldonado was is a poor man's Austin Hedges. Ooh. <laughs> so I finally got the video feed up there. Andres was not, not happy about that. But, yeah, it, the the guys who went out and crushed the Guardians in this one are not the guys you kind of expect to crush the Guardians. This was not their, you know, their big-name players. But Plesak didn't play well. He didn't pitch well. I think anytime anyone has that many walks, you can call it a bad outing, uh, no matter how you cut it. And then... I mean, offensively, there just wasn't anything there. Uh, three stars in this is, is kind of hard to do. You give it for sure to Austin Hedges, because he had two base hits. Um, you know, they had no extra base hits in this one, which you know, I feel like it's starting to become a theme. And listen, it, it's hard. They have a lot of rookies facing a very good pitcher in Justin Verlander. I remember when he was in Detroit, I thought he was cooked. Does anyone else remember that? When it looked like he might be cooked as a starter? Um, instead, we get him you know, just continuing to excel. I don't know how. I don't know how he continues to excel how he has, but it just keeps happening. He's been darn good this year. And, you know, Will Benson's first start, he went 0 for 3 with uh, two strikeouts, which still, yeah, it's reach base. We'll see what happens. It's, I, don't, can't, I don't think I got to in yesterday's game, or if I did, it was just in passing. I thought it was really. You can see who's the priority prospect by who plays. Uh, I thought it was weird that uh, Freeman at shortstop and Andres were just, I guess he's just second base. Like That is his position now, and they're not going to mess with it. But uh, across the board, ugly game. Three stars. Let's get back to it. Uh, Hedges. I'm laughing because I'm like, do, do I give it to Shaw? I think I, I almost have to give one to Shaw here. Uh, and then I guess I'm going to give it Stephen Kwan for continuing his hit streak. But it's a game where you struggle to find a positive. Uh, box score bingo, the Guardians had four you know, base runner situations. They should have a run off of that. They did not. Uh, the other side, 11 hits, 6 walks, that's 17 there. The Guardians' error, uh, I'm sorry, Cleveland actually had 5 opportunities to fight by Houston's error. But, so, 11, 6, 17, error, 18 opportunities. Should be about six runs. Uh, Cleveland got beat in just about all aspects of this one, and they drop the game uh, to Houston. It's... I, I don't feel good about this series. I do not feel even remotely good. Uh, you know, having... We're getting the hardest parts of their lineup. I am curious to see. Uh, I'll probably, you know, when I do my pause for break... I think everyone assumed tomorrow would be a Shaw or Kirk McCarty game. I watched his volume down, so I don't know if it was announced in-game. I'm going to do a quick search in between. But I just wanted to get my initial thought, and I wanted to throw it on and just record as the game was ending. Uh, I've been 
I were, you know, it's been a bit of a good luck this year to do it. So I was like, hey, I'll try anything. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't help him out. Just to look at the other ones. I mean, uh, well, tomorrow's game, anyone versus Framber that they're going to put is going to be a mismatch for Houston. Quantrell versus Garcia advantage Houston. McKenzie, Christian Javier, depending on which Tristan McKenzie you get, could be advantage Cleveland. But it's it's going to be a rough weekend. I, I don't see any other way around it. Uh, this, you know, they're, I am happy. I like the lineup. I like the players that were in the lineup today. I don't know if I necessarily want to jump out and say I loved the lineup, but there wasn't any real big issue with that lineup anyways. But I liked going with the youth. So that's going to be what we see. We're going to see a young lineup, guys getting opportunities. They have some hard choices to make with this team. We're going to take our first break, come back, and talk about uh, some thoughts I have on how we talk about prospects. Our first fantastic sponsor are our good friends over at BlueChew.com. I have been talking about Blue Chew for quite a time, and the reason that I have been continuing to talk about them is one, they're a sponsor, but two, they're a quality product. They make something original. That's what I always talk about. You are not going to get an item that you would find when you go to the mall jeweler there. This is a company that targets, you know, fine jewelry for, you know, people who have means. They're, they're going out and trying to make sure that if you spend money on jewelry, and jewelry, as we all know, is expensive, you're going to get something that is, you know, it can become a, a, a you know, family treasure. That this is something that will be stand out, original, and will be a gift that, you know, someone will cherish forever. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com. And going on now is the Blue Nile anniversary sale. Save up to 40% on classic fine jewelry pieces and 25% on engagement ring settings. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop, shop stress-free and find your forever piece. Go to BlueNile.com today. You know, I said I wouldn't wade into it, and then I went on Twitter. Uh, no one really knows who's starting tomorrow. Uh, Connor Pilkington is lined up, and that does seem very likely that he would get the call up. Uh, I went into it with Hiram, uh, which I know, what's the point, but uh, I really get amused when someone's like, hey, you know, so these are the things that have amused me recently. Segment two, what's amusing me? Uh, being told, well, Aaron Savale says that Bo Naylor is a great caller and framer already. I'm like, that's great. And you know how many really bad defensive catchers I've had a veteran tell me is a good defender? Quite a few. Because <laughs> they're not going to bag on the young player. It is always positive when they talk about their teammates. I have... You know, I spent, what, three years in AA, and I never once heard a player say anything remotely negative about another player. Uh, and when it was young kids, it was always really, you know, shining them up. So you can't take anything you're hearing from them as an objective scouting report. They're being a good teammate. End of story. Two, the other thing that's amused me of late is, because, you know, we discuss things at the deadline, and there is a large percentage of fans who were just like, and, you know, I, I talk to people in the comments because I always respond to the comments here on YouTube. But a number of people were like, how can you feel like good about where this team is? And I'm telling you right now, a lot of people did. Like the last thing they wanted to do is trade away any prospects. And I tweeted out the comparison stats of, you know, George Valera versus Clint uh, Frazier, now Jackson Frazier, when they were the same age at every level. And they're almost identical. So take that for what it's worth. And it also kind of got to me. Because there's a lot of people who are like, you can't trade George uh, Valera. He is the greatest outfield prospect since Manny. And it's like, that's not true. It's just not. He is not the highest rated outfield prospect since Manny. Uh, you know, there was Grady Sizemore in there. <laughs> and uh, Frazier was very highly rated. But it's, it's interesting to me, whenever anyone does that, you know, whenever someone talks about, like, he is the greatest prospect, uh, you know, since... It's never, you know, honestly, it's like if you're going to say compare someone, it's like, uh, you know, if, if we were to talk about, for instance, we really don't have any first base prospects in system, but it's like if someone was a really great first base prospect, they should be the best first base prospect since Matt Laporta, because that's how you should compare it. If you're comparing prospects to prospects, well, they didn't work out in the big leagues. Those were the best prospects. We always compare them to, this is the greatest since this guy that was successful, but we're just going to kind of ignore all the failure rates. And that's, especially when it comes to catch it. Listen, honest to goodness truth, 
catchers are the most flammable asset a baseball team has. They are the biggest bust. They are the hardest to develop. They are the riskiest thing you can draft. There is so much to that position. Very few guys come up, stay, and become immediate day one starters for the next you know, 10 years. You know, Adley Rushman is a generational catching talent. He's the best since Parker, po- Parker Posey. Nope. She'd be an interesting catcher with her size. Buster Posey. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think Bo Naylor has a chance to be a very good catcher, but I also recognize the risks inherent in that position, and I am not going to be comfortable with any catching prospect ever. Uh, for the same reason that, like, when I did all of my draft work, I'm like, yeah, I'm never going to have a pitcher in the top 15, probably ever again, never going to have a prep pitcher that high, because I know you're going to miss at least one season of development at some point. Like, that's, the odds are in favor of them getting hurt that's just the truth of the matter and that's why at the same time once they get through those upper levels and you have them in the higher levels that's where i kind of value pitching more once you have that proven asset uh, to that degree and that's why personally you know i'd much rather hold on to pitchers than hitters in the upper levels and you know i'm listen i I understand we get very precious about our prospects and you can go back and look at it. Like the, the Andrew Miller deal was fantastic. But my goodness, for a reliever, they traded away their number one and two relief prospects. Ben Heller was hitting 100 miles an hour. He hasn't worked out. J.P. Fireeyes, and before he got hurt, was looking really good for the Rays. He was a central part of that. Justice Sheffield was a top 60 prospect as a left-handed pitcher. I get it hasn't worked out for him, but he was a really interesting left-handed starter. Uh, and then... Clint Frazier was a top 30, top 40 prospect. So they paid a lot for a reliever. A lot. And if you're going to go out and get someone, it's going to be pricey. And you can't be too precious. You just can't. We can go back and look at old prospect lists. And you know, for every success, there's five failures. And I'm not saying you go out and trade everyone, but specifically with this team right now, you go out and are willing to be a little more, I, at least you know, I view it, you should be more willing to make trades because like, I was thinking about this team and you know, as I went through the stats yesterday and I'm like, you know, Angel Martinez isn't in my top 10, but he, like, he's close, but like almost any other organization he would be. The depth here, just because a guy isn't a top 10 prospect in Cleveland doesn't really don't consider that a negative. They're top 15. Uh, can They don't have necessarily the high-end guys, and that's when I did the preseason roundtable. Like, everyone talked about the top systems in the American League Central, and everyone was very focused on, you know, Kansas City's got Bobby Witt, and the Tigers have um, uh, not Spen- Spencer Torkelson. I know I said Spencer Riley and Riley Green, uh, and not to mention all their pitchers. But, uh, you know, this team has built so much depth that I, you, I don't know. I view it as they have the pieces to go out and improve this team. And Jose Ramirez is going to get younger. Shane Bieber may not be here in a year. I think you got a window you should have jumped in. I don't think you want to sit back and be too precious about anything. And you know, Stephen Kwan has established himself. Miles Straw is a solid player. If Oscar Gonzalez and Nolan Jones work in the outfield, guess what? George Valera doesn't have a home. Now, pitching is a whole other matter, and that's also part of the reason why like, I looked at it as I'm not going to trade Espino or Williams, but I, I'm not... Their depth is ridiculous. they got to figure it out. You know, we went through the uh, list yesterday. We're going to continue to do Rule 5 talk. It's going to be something to watch, or they're going to lose multiple guys in this year's Rule 5 draft. We're going to take a break come back and talk about the underrated pitching prospects in the system this year. And our sponsor is our good friends, Bet Online. You know them, you love them. They're our second oldest sponsor. They're the fastest and easiest way to check on all your betting needs. Find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports wagering information. From live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts, they have you covered. Bet online, where the game starts. Underrated prospects. So I thought it was kind of interesting if we just look at Guardians pitchers. Let me pull my camera up here so I can make sure I'm not 
blocking myself in the mic. Uh, if you look at FIP, which is Fielding Independent uh, ERA, which is one of those great, you know, maybe the best um, indicator type of stat for pitchers, uh, that, if you want to know who are the worst ones in the system, it's Tobias Myers, who's gone, Adam Scott, Tommy Mace, Mason Hickman, and Tanner Burns. Not, not an exciting group. Eighth, Doug Nikhazy. We talked about all the great pitchers from last year's class. This team, we'll see how he works out. You know, he's still in high A, but an SEC performer, they've had a hard time in the second round. Uh, that's just... Uh, for whatever reason, it has not been their most successful plays. Peyton Beaton, Field 9, Rodney Boone, 10. Those are the guys who, who you know, at the same time, you know, I dropped the innings to minimum of 50. So you're still looking at something like uh, Boone of 434, 11, Jamie Arias, who's been all over. He's been at almost every level. He's got a 402 FIP. That's not a bad FIP at all. But who's got the best FIPs? Who has the best fielding independent? Jack Leftwich, who... Now he's 23 and pitching at low and high A. Great for him, but they need to move him quickly through the system. Uh, but he is number one, 232 FIP. Still trying to figure out the mic issues. Uh, number two is Joey Cantillo. And it's getting harder and harder to not put him in. Listen, the guys, we know they're going to protect our Naylor. We know they're going to protect Brennan. We know they're going to protect uh, Angel Martinez. I think Gabriel Rodriguez is very likely. Joey Cantillo is going to be hard to leave off that list. I mean, you just can go look at the numbers uh, in general. And again, his FIP and the hard hit percent, no one's hitting him. No one's hitting him hard. He's missing a ton of bats. He's a lefty. He's missed developmental time due to injuries. I mean, basically injuries are the only thing that's holding him back. Uh, David Sharp, kind of an under, maybe, I don't know if I want to say underappreciated, but you know, another one of those two-way guys who's really excelling once he's come to Cleveland. Gavin Williams, Will Dion, Reed Johnston, Juan Zapata, Tanner Bybee, Logan Allen, Tanner Tully at 10. So that's interesting. That's an indicator stat to talk about just success rate. Uh, who has the highest K percentage? That would belong to Joey Cantillo. So I know we've talked about Cantillo a lot, but he he's an underrated prospect because is he in the top 10? No. Is he even considered a top 10 prospect? No. Is he a top 5 pitching prospect? One can make that case. One can legitimately make the case that he should be considered. You know, you have, right now to me, the big three of Espino, Bybee, and Williams. And then there's Logan Allen. And then you can debate that fifth spot. There's a whole tier of guys. Cantillo is making a case to be the guy. He is making a legitimate case. And is he in that 11 to 15 range? He might be. He might be a guy you should consider in that range. Uh, Who's seventh on that list, though? Another guy in that range, Hunter Gaddis, who we had on the show. Uh, It's, you know, the top five uh, in terms of K percentage. Cantillo, Leftwich, Allen, Williams, Bybee, if you're wondering about Espino. Hasn't pitched enough innings. I mean, he's been hurt more than half the season. it's It's an issue. It is an issue. Going around to some other stats. How about our K to walk ratio? Something we know matters to this team. Jack Leftwich. And Leftwich is interesting because Leftwich could have been a, I don't know if he would have been a first rounder, but he definitely could have been like a second or third rounder out of high school. Went to Florida, was inconsistent in Florida, which is the story. I mean, that's Tommy Mace and him. Neither of them really showed great development. You look at Brandon Sprout, who's returning to Florida next year, and I laugh because I'm like, inconsistent. And hey, that's that's the story with these two guys Cleveland drafted. Leftwich has been, you know, old for his level. But he has been utterly dominant. Uh, a walk rate of barely over one and a half, a strikeout rate over 12. Just keep keep moving that dude up. Uh, David Sharp, another guy who started the year in low A, went up to double A. Uh, Tanner Bybee is third on that list. Then comes Reed Johnston. Tanner Tully is fifth. It's, it's you know, some similar names overall there. Who has the lowest walk percentage? That'd be Tanner Tully, followed by Jack Leftwich, Davis Sharp, Tanner Bybee, Reed Johnston. And underrated prospect. Like, this, you know, with hitters, I kind of went full on, like, names we don't know. The problem with pitchers are it's mostly going to be starters, and most of them we know because it's a much smaller pool. We might be undervaluing Tanner Bybee. We might be undervaluing him. He's outperforming Gavin Williams with similar stuff. 
And in terms of performance between the two, you know, both went from high A to double A this year. Bybee's been better with stuff that isn't that far off. Bybee is underrated because he should be considered in that elite tier. Honestly, he should be. The elite tier of prospects of Valera, Rocchio, uh, Espino, Williams, and Bybee, right now, I think those are the top five prospects in the system. And if you want to disagree with that, that's fine. But he has gained like seven miles an hour. He is still not walking anyone. He's excelling in the upper minors now. And yeah, Bybee, Bybee is underrated because I think he's almost on similar footing with Gavin Williams. Gavin Williams has you know, a little more velocity, he has a little more size. The pick, pitch mix is a little bit wider and some of the secondary offerings I think have more potential, but I don't think it's as much of a separator as we would have thought um, this time a year ago. And then, let's see, so, you know, just going through, Oh yeah, Mason Hickman's missing a lot of bats, but he hasn't had that velocity jump I was kind of hoping he'd have when they drafted him. Uh, going further down the list, like I'd really have to open it up to relievers, I think, to pull someone out who uh, might surprise. Like if I drop this to 30, all of a sudden we get, you know, we're going to get some more data here, but I really hate under 50 innings in terms of sample size. Kate Smith is missing, has a K per 9 of 15. Not bad for a player who's undrafted out of the 2020 draft. So if you want that guy who's really off the beaten path, Cade Smith. We've talked about Andrew uh, Misiazic, who he has struggled a little bit more since he's gotten up to AAA, but he's still second best K rate in the system. In terms of, you know, again, let's let's look at the important stuff here. K to walk ratio, Andrew Misiazic is one. Nick Enright, four. Enright's like mid 90s, highly productive, has not struggled at any stop this year. Great K rate, great walk rate. What do you do with him? Do you add him? Or do you hope you pass, he passes through the Rule 5? I think there's a good chance, I mean, if I'm a bad team, I take Nick Enright. The performance is enough there that that makes him stand out. Right now, could he be the top relief prospect in system? Potentially, I could see someone saying that just based on performance and consistent uh, you know, growth as a player. Jake Miller had a rough start at the beginning of the year, and San Diego State kid, biggest bonus on day three in 2021. Go to look at the numbers now. Strikeout per nine, 11.5. Walk per nine of 2.67. He is 10th in K to walk ratio. Probably needs to get moved up, but you'll take it. Uh, that's the problem. Why? One of the reasons they kind of need to promote some of these young starters is just so they can make space. It is, it is interesting, beyond interesting, the depth in this organization. Uh, they just they have pitching for days. It's just it's the truth of that. There is so much pitching that good pitching prospects prospects are blocking each other. Uh, go back and just looking at FIP again with uh, with our relievers thrown in. Mizzy Ozick is one. Leftwich, two. Cantillo, three. Davis Sharp, four. And again, Davis Sharp. He fits that underrated profile. Uh, Two-way guy at Clemson. Clemson's developmental record is very shaky, if I'm being honest. There's not been, for a program that gets the recruits that it gets, you'd expect a little bit more. Um, you know, they got a lot of attention back when Seth Beer was there, but it, it's... We saw what he did with Arizona this past week. Uh, Jake Jewell, you know, is an older player in, in AAA there at five. Gavin Williams at six because when you drop it, he is because he had 79 innings, so he was you know, kind of just below that 80. When you open it up here, um, yeah, and that's the thing. They, again, Williams is the better prospect, but it's not the gap that it once I think it was. And right at seven, Kate Smith eight, Tim Heron the lefty. At nine, uh, ninth best. And again, he might be their top left hand reliever. And then, man, Raymond Burgos. I just wish that guy could stay healthy. When, when I was the guy talking about Brian Levastida and Cody Morris as your helium guys, my third helium guy in that group was Raymond Burgos. I believe he's an 11th round pick, which is like the highly valuable round for the Guardians. They put a lot of value in that. Just health lefty who's not had any success with health. 
uh, in the minors. But yeah, I think and the big takeaway, one, uh, Tanner Bybee should be higher rated than he is most places. If he's not listed in top five prospects, I don't think they're doing it right. Two, they have so much good pitching, it's blocking other good pitching. I mean, there's so many of these college guys that you just want to keep moving up, but it's like, where where do you put them? How are they going to get reps? And three, if they don't add, if they don't figure out this 40-man mess, teams love adding starting pitchers. Like Most players taking the Rule 5 are relief pitchers who were starters. They draft a starter, put him in the pen, and you can hide a guy back there. Curry is an uh, easy. Like Curry and Gaddis are guys who I think their future might be in the pen. Uh, if you don't put them on, they're not going to pass through. At least with like a Gabriel Rodriguez, you have a chance that that guy gets through waivers. And then the big three bats, <laughs> Joey Cant- Cantillo is not getting through. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And again, I'm just... Kate Smith, the walk rate's high. But if he can figure it out, if they can keep working with him, again, undrafted free agent, all the way up to double A already, and leads the minors in K ratio, in, in K per nine. Uh, even when you expand it out, I mean, and it's it's not even a minor gap. He's got nearly uh, 1.3 strikeouts per nine lead. I mean, it, it's a, he is missing a crazy amount of bats. And he's got a 346 bat pip. He's been incredibly unlucky. And that's the other interesting thing. Logan Allen, bad bat pip against. Andrew Miziasic, bad bat, bat, bat pip against. Um, we're running out of time. The other thing I would just say is the batted ball profile. We know this is a team that likes guys with high fly ball rates. Third highest fly ball rate, Nick Enright. Fifth, Xavier Curry. Eighth, Hunter Gaddis. You know, I, I think they are going to... I mean, at this point in time, I don't know when Savali is going to be healthy. I could probably go check out what the general thought is, but I think it's time to see what a Curry or Gaddis can do. And Gaddis is supposed to go on Saturday. I don't know if they would move someone up. I'd have to go see when his last start was. We're probably getting Pilkington tomorrow, but I'd love to have seen. You know, it's definitely not going to be Curry because he pitched yesterday. But I'd love to see some of these young, interesting arms go. I've been Jeff Ellis with Locked and Guardians Podcast for this week. Remember to rate and review, download daily. It helps. Subscribe on the YouTube. Let me know. Stick with the you know the camera I pulled out. That's a wider one here. Or go back to the old integrated. Uh, camera. Uh, as always, let me know how things are going with the podcast. I rely on the users to let me know. And as I end every show, go, go, Guardians, go.